In this episode, I am joined by Vadim Gladyshev. Together, we discuss the use of omics in aging research. We talk about the place of metabolomics in a field largely dominated by DNA methylation, how aging research can and probably will impact all of biomedical research in the near future, from cancer to Alzheimer's disease and cardiovascular research, and the reversibility of aging markers in various models. Listen in on this episode and don't forget to connect on LinkedIn to continue the conversation that we start today with Vadim Gladyshev. Welcome back to the Metabolomist for a third season, where we will dive into the concrete applications of metabolomics and where this tool will impact society in the next five to 10 years. I am your host, Alice Limonciel, and this year I am joined by a diverse group of scientists, medical doctors, and other professionals who have used metabolomics and pushed it beyond just descriptive studies and towards applications that will or are already impacting people's lives. This year, the keyword is really impact. Like you, I know the potential of metabolomics. In the last two seasons, I've discussed with many metabolomists about how powerful, sensitive and informative metabolomics can be. But this year, I want to zoom in on the impact, the applications that are or soon will be changing our lives for the better. Welcome to The Metabolomist. Today, I'm joined by Vadim Gladyshev. Good morning. Good Thank morning you. to you. You're very welcome. Thank you for joining me. You are currently professor of medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School. You started your career looking at redox and selenium biology. And yes. today you focus more on the mechanisms of lifespan control, looking at longevity signatures. Maybe you want to add certain uh, steps in the, in the middle or things that you find interesting that you want to mention. Uh, I think it's good. But, but yes, right. we, start, we started research with selenium and then expanded to redox biology and then about 15 mm -hmm. years ago expanded into aging research. And that's really the main topic is trying to understand the nature of aging and lifespan control. And is selenium and redox like did that or did these topics bring you to aging? Or uh, what was the link? Well, uh, the the link is, is interesting. So we when I started my independent uh, position, faculty position, we try to identify um, selenium proteins, uh, which are which are the proteins which contain the trace element selenium which is an essential trace element in, in humans. And one of the major kind of advances that we achieved is the um, discovery of a full set of such proteins. There are 25 genes that code for selenocysteine, which is the 21st amino acid in the genetic code. It's encoded by uh, stop codon, UGA, and selenocysteine, uh, the amino acid, is synthesized on the tRNA, selenocysteine tRNA, and then inserted into proteins called translationally. So this is a very uh, interesting mechanism, quite unique one. Then we found these little proteins, 25, and realized that they are oxidative reductases. So we found ourselves in the redox biology area. <laughs> we, we expanded on this. And once in the redox area, I've got invitations to go to aging meetings because of the oxidative stress, ideas, reactive oxygen species, and kind of links mm -hmm. with aging. So I've been exposed to the aging research and realized that Actually, we don't understand what what aging is. <laughs> There's no consensus. And uh, at the same time, it's such an interesting unanswered question. So kind of expanded into that. And once we started working on it, it's very hard to convince people to work on anything else. They join the lab and they all want to work on aging. And, okay. and this is our main topic now. And I guess maybe the time that you joined the aging field was about the time when omics were getting big. So I think these are some of the main tools that you use in your work. You work a lot with omics. Yeah, we always used omics for, mm -hmm. for the last five years. Initially, mm -hmm. we've done genome sequencing and actually we've done all, all the omics <laughs> to some degree. But we moved to the aging field about 15 years ago. And then we've done several studies at the level of the metabolome and transcriptome and genomes, of course, methylome, mm -hmm. DNA, and so on. And at what stage did you encounter metabolomics? I think it's about 10 years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, we mm, initiated our studies on the nature of aging and 
the idea we had is that aging is a negative consequence of being alive, meaning that we have uh, active processes, metabolism, and as it does whatever it does, the reactions and directions do whatever they do, but they, at the same time, they produce negative consequences. At the level of metabolites, it's easy to conceptualize in the form of byproducts, metabolic byproducts, some kind of damage forms, which accumulate over time. But of course, this damage is more general, broader uh, at, at, at any level of biological organization. And so it, this damage accumulates over time, and in essence, th this is what we think aging is. And 10 years ago, we wanted to test this idea by quantifying mm, this uh, negative consequences, metabolic byproducts. And so we use metabolomics to simply quantify the number of molecules, molecules we can detect as a function of age. Uh, and we've done it in flies, and we found that actually that number increases with age. And interestingly, uh, it increases up to the level of kind of mean mortality in the species, and it's kind of nicely corresponds to what, what we know about what we know about mortality, and it would slow down by calorie restriction, and, mm -hmm. and so so basically it was a, a useful exercise, and we published uh, a paper in July about ten years ago on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And maybe to put the field of aging research in a context for the audience who may not be experts in aging. So what do you think are the, the main impacts that this research can have on society? How will the audience benefit from this work, you think, in coming years? I, I cannot think of a, of a more important topic because biomedical research is basically organized about diseases, right? So mm -hmm. some people study cancer or diabetes or Alzheimer's disease or heart disease and so on. Mm -hmm. But if you think of the the nature of these diseases, the way incidence changes, uh, it actually grows exponentially with age. So age is the main risk factor. It dwarfs any th any other features like lifestyle, for example, or diets or drugs. Mm -hmm. Age is by far the main risk factor. Mm -hmm. And so if we try to if we understand aging and try to influence just tiny bit, it actually would. Uh, delay the onset of all of these diseases at once, all yeah. the chronic diseases. So some of them yeah. will be completely gone, and, but yeah. some will, will be replaced with others, but they will be delayed, all of them. So mm -hmm. the, the impact would be huge, and not comparable to anything that we know in medicine. Mm -hmm. So And maybe it's a perfect time then to introduce the, the paper we wanted to discuss, because in that paper, you discuss exactly how this biological age is reversible and kind of flexible. So that because we accumulate this damage or or this age and then you could think that once you've consumed your age potential then you can't come back but what you show and what others have probably shown as well but what you show in that paper is that to some extent some of that can be recovered yeah. right so yeah. the, i will just maybe tell the the title of the paper for the for the listeners so it's called um, biological age is increased by stress and restored upon recovery, published in Cell Metabolism, and uh, Jesse Poganik is the first author. And can you tell us a little bit about what you did in that in that study and what you what you found out? So, like in many other studies, this paper was developed in order to understand the nature of aging, and so we wanted to test this idea that severe stress transiently increases biological age. And that's what we found. We report four model systems. It's a trauma, like emergency surgery, severe COVID-19, when somebody get, gets infected, goes to the hospital, to the ICU, to the ventilator. At that point, the biological age is the highest. And then once a, a, a person recovers, then the biological age is decreased. We also described pregnancy. So we found that... Um, during, during pregnancy, biological age uh, of women increases uh, up to the third trimester, and it's decreased back to approximately normal uh, postpartum. And the final model was parabiosis, where we connect young and old mice, and the young mice re reversibly kind of increase biological age. Once the mice are separated, uh, then they also recover. The way we tested uh, this idea is primarily uh, is the use of epigenetic clock ox, which are aging biomarkers based on cytosine methylation in the DNA. So we have a, a tool um, based on uh, DNA methylation arrays 
that to quantify biological age. But we also used metabolomics in the study also to show that in the case of parabiosis, metabolites follow basically the same idea as DNA methylation, meaning that they show reversible changes. The, the, the severe stress induces changes associated with aging, and then once the stress is relieved, metabolite patterns recover to the more to the younger state. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned the epigenomics. I think this is the main omic that you work with, right? So I don't know if that's a common thing in aging or if it's your own preference, but it's one that is quite prominent in the field, isn't it? Yes, it's the most prominent. Currently, the aging clocks, or aging biomarkers, uh, they exist at multiple omics levels, but they are the most robust at the level of DNA methylation. And mm-hmm. so that's what we use primarily, but we also have biomarkers based on transcriptomic patterns, based on the proteomic patterns. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't have yet metabolomic biomarkers, but we are interested in developing them as well. You explained the four different types of stress that you applied and then the different omics that you were looking at and how the epigenomics is a good measure of aging. Um, so in this study, then, when you combined the epigenomics with with metabolomics, transcriptomics, and so on, did, did you study them all together, or did you apply specific omics to sp- specific parts of the study? And what did it bring when you used them together? Well, in that study, we have not combined the omics. Mm-hmm. We just used them separately. The name mm-hmm. is was the main omics level, and Metabolomics was used as, um, in a way, as a supplementary mm-hmm. uh, level, yeah, omics modality. But it also had this flexibility to the to the stress inflicted, right? So you you also saw with metabolomics, which personally I would expect, like you see an impact of the stress and then the release of the the effect of the stress. You also saw that with metabolomics and transcriptomics too, right? What we observed at the level of metabolomics was similar to what we observed at the DNA methylation level. It's mm-hmm. just the DNA methylation levels are more developed as of now in quantifying biological age, mm-hmm. and metabolomics is just a little bit kind of lags behind, although it's as potentially is as useful. I know when you looked at the transcriptomics and metabolomics, you looked at at pathways that are behind this this signature that you saw. But um, also when you use the epigenomics, do you also look at which genes are affected or are you more interested in the general shape of the change? Where, how do you approach this? Well, at the level of gene methylation, typically we are not interested in any particular set of genes uh, because aging is a systemic process. It kind of results from all of the processes combined. Mm-hmm. This is an important feature and kind of to, to consider because uh, we are trained as reductionists. So mm-hmm. we identify a, a component of a complex system and study it and, and then try to explain the complex system through these components. But uh, sometimes the complex system is not represented by the components uh, and so-called uh, properties of emergence. And aging is one such process. So we need to think about aging in a systemic way, not really through individual genes. It's really interesting because it's a very different approach to what is usually done with um, with omics, at least the way that I've used it and, and the way that you often see it with metabolomics, where, yes, we look at the overall uh, dynamics of the omic or of the omics, but then we go and dig into the mechanisms. But I, I, as you explained well, where why that's relevant in that way for for aging it's interesting so you think then what happens is more an overall is it a bit like a car engine getting a bit rusty or a bit a bit dirty and then cleaning up the system by changing the methylation status is it something like this um, um, well methylation status is the it's a biomarker it's mm-hmm. not necessarily a causal factor it's just a way for us to measure how old an organism is biologically. Mm-hmm. Uh, potentially, other methods could be used. I mean, as, as mm-hmm. I mentioned, uh, transcriptomes to quantify uh, aging and, and proteomes and, and potentially metabolomes can be used. But ultimately, in the future, it's going to be a multiomic approach. Uh, mm-hmm. um, maybe even more than multiomic, uh, combining omics levels with something else like wearables, some you know imaging and so on. 
And this methylation at the level of the metabolome, is that also affected in aging? Is that also a type of marker you could look for in metabolomics to look for methylations or the methylation machinery uh, in different omics? Uh, are you talking about methylation at the, yeah. at the metabolite level? Yeah. It could influence, of course, uh, like the, the source of... Um, like acetylazine methionine, for example, you know, of course, the would affect methylation, like methyltransferases or tet and tet enzymes would affect. Mm -hmm. Of course, it, it would, but um, uh, this is I, I haven't seen anybody studying that particular aspect. Okay, okay. then I'll, I'll keep waiting for more information on this. Is there a specific aspect of the Poganic paper you would like to discuss? Was there something that surprised you or that was really? A discovery for the field that we haven't mentioned. I would say it's a uh, it was quite rewarding that it, because initially we had this uh, idea of reversible changes, and when we started studying, um, finding that indeed there are reversible changes in in biological age. Uh, mm -hmm. So, to me, the the main outcome of this is the invitation to think about the nature of aging. Actually, mm -hmm. because mm, some people would think that these reversible changes would not represent increased aging. So they kind of think of aging as a steady process of slowing just to kind of one way direction. Uh, whereas we think it's the biological age more fluid, uh, it kind of can fluctuate. Of course, this is not a settled issue. I mean, it's possible we are wrong. Mm -hmm. Just two days ago, there was another paper published uh, also in Cell Metabolism uh, by a group from Yale where they extended our studies, they studied exclusively pregnancy. And they found, uh, they, they, they had a larger cohort than, than us. Um, uh, we, actually, in our study, we had both human cohorts and, and mice. We studied mice changes in biological age during pregnancy in mice. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the Yale study, they only used uh, human, but they had a larger cohort. And they also studied the effect of uh, breastfeeding. So they found that the men who breastfed, they recover more rapidly. Uh, postpartum um, in terms of decreasing biological age. So I, it was very rewarding to see that the other group studied it. But at the same time, I was asked actually to comment just uh, two days ago, there was a science conduct me in Nature, Stat, and some other uh, journalists. They, they all wanted to, to cover that story. Uh, and some of the issues that emerged from that is whether aging can be reversed. Some people say that this study uh, shows that aging is reversible. I think aging is irreversible. It kind of goes in, in one direction in general, but the biological age is still fluid. So meaning that if we think about aging from the perspective of damage accumulation, so under severe stress, there's more damage. And once the, the stressor is, is removed, that damage may be partially cleared. So biological age of the system can recover in part. This is also something that is often discussed in metabolomic uh, research because you have a similar effect on the metabolome as a kind of uh, readout of the phenotype at a, at a very different level from DNA methylation, but you also get this dynamic effect and this impact on the metabolome as a risk factor. So you see that when you have certain interventions, you can reduce the risk in, by changing the metabolome or let's say in parallel to changing the metabolome. That's really interesting for me because I think historically DNA methylation has been the omics that has offered the most so far to, to aging research. But I'm, I'm really curious to see, and, and we will discuss this in a minute, like I think metabolomics probably needs to, to grow a little bit more to be fully useful in aging or to be even more relevant in aging. But when it does this, I, I can imagine that it will also bring something, especially for this study of the, the reversible effects, because it has the flexibility required for this. We wanted also to discuss uh, another paper that you already alluded, alluded to a few minutes ago. This one is from uh, 2015. And it's a paper that is entitled uh, Organization of the Mammalian Metabolome According to Organ Function, Lineage, Specialization, and Longevity, also in cell met metabolism. I is this a paper from your, your first encounter with metabolomics? Or it's, it's a quite extensive metabolomics paper. Can you discuss it? Yeah, sure. I'm quite proud of that paper, actually. So because it's a very extensive study where we analyzed uh, metabolite profiling subjected uh, tissues you know, with about profiling for 26 species of mammals, three organs, liver, brain, kidney, 
and multiple multiple representatives of, of each species and this mini biological replicas. So it's a very extensive study. It was done in collaboration with uh, Clary Klisch at the Broad. Actually, we we do a lot of our metabolite profiling at the, the Broad Institute. And this study it's linked to other studies at the omics level. So we've done also at, at the level of the transcriptome for the same set of species and samples, and also at the level of INOM. By INOM we mean sets of chemical elements mm-hmm. like you know selenium, okay. iron, zinc. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks. I would have guessed, but I didn't know that term. Either. Yeah. <laughs> so, so about twenty elements we quantified. There was a separate paper that we published when we quantified twenty elements, and and we also studied this. But but in that cell metabolism study, we quantified several hundred metabolites across all of these tissues and species, and uh, identifying some metabolite changes that associated with uh, species specific biology, with organ biology, as well as um, we identified sets of metabolites which uh, which represent um, changes in lifespan across species. And I would comment that uh, in mammals, there is a great diversity in lifespan. It's a great model system. Uh, mammals differ about 100-fold in lifespan. You know, if you compare shortest leaves like shrew, some, some shrews, they, they live only one year. And some whales, they live uh, maybe up to two, 200 years. This can be studied, and we use this model system to try to understand how does nature uh, change lifespan. Because when we study this in the lab, typically, like in mice, we could achieve only you know 10%, 20% change in lifespan in response to longevity interventions, like calorie restriction or some genetic manipulations or apomycin treatment. Whereas across species, there is like a 100 to 200 fold difference in lifespan. And so somehow nature changes uh, metabolic pathways and, and other processes so that lifespan is so dramatically changed. So we try to understand how exactly does it do it and and maybe we could use that information in the future to modify lifespan in model organ. Mm-hmm. I think already 10 years ago you were looking for um, ways to fill the the gaps of what you need from metabolomics because we've discussed this when we prepared the episode i was asking what kind of developments would you need to see in metabolomics and the information that it provides for it to be most useful to your research and you mentioned exactly the things that you mentioned in this study also for example like organ specific metabolites or the quantification of damage so can you can you comment a bit more in detail about this what would met- metabolomics need to do to become really relevant for people who do the kind of research you do. Yeah, I think metabolomics is already relevant. It's just that every omics level provides some common information and, and there's some more useful information at a certain level for a, any omics, like, for example, DNA methylation that we use primarily to quantify uh, aging is um, useful because DNA is quite stable molecule. and DNA methylation varies from like zero to one, so either fully methylated or not methylated. So in that sense, it's kind of very robust to quantification. It can be compared across species, at least in mammals. There are many advantages. Plus, we can quantify like millions of CPG sites, methylation mm-hmm. of CPG sites at the same time. Uh, uh, for example, a transcriptomics is also useful because it kind of tells about the biology involved, right? Mm-hmm. So, quantify similar sets of genes. Uh, in the case of metabolites, uh, one, I guess, disadvantage is that we are still not able to quantify as many uh, molecules as other omics levels, right? Like, for example, mm-hmm. pre- so DNA methylation or transcriptomics. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are other advantages that uh, metabolites are kind of the same uh, in, in different tissues. Uh, and uh, also, uh, if, for example, methods are better developed to reliably quantify kind of more molecules, so maybe mm-hmm. reliably, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this will be especially useful for aging research because many of these molecules present damage. Mm-hmm. So aging, I just returning back to what I've been trying to say uh, from the beginning of this podcast is that when biology happens, then uh, it also produces byproducts, you know, damaging molecules. And at the level of metabolites, we don't know whether something that is detected represents damage or or kind of metabolite, mm-hmm. a useful metabolite that, that is utilized with a particular purpose. But 
This is also something you see when you follow specific metabolites and you follow the, the research about these metabolites. Many of them have been described as waste products. Mm -hmm. And then 5, 10, 20 years later, they become signaling molecules. Yes. <laughs> so a lot of this damage, um, these, these damaged molecules might become very strong signaling molecules in the near future. Th that's true. But with mm -hmm. the better detection, I think we will yeah. uncover in more and more of the true molecular damage. Because, the, for example, yeah. if you think of like there is a, re there is a reaction and it produces one extra molecule of a byproduct, there's mm -hmm. no way a, a cell can detect that extra molecule. It, it would be there. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and there are probably many such molecules in cells and, and, and in some of them, in many cases, they accumulate over time. Yeah. And then... Um... The quantification aspect, you men mentioned relative quantification. Do, do you need absolute quantification in your work or is it not necessary? Well, of course, it would be better if you could quantify in absolute levels, but, you know, so far relative levels also work. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, another aspect that you also touched upon a little bit is mm -hmm. organ-specific metabolites. This mm -hmm. is something that uh, i quite interested, but not yet explored sufficiently, meaning that some metabolites, that, for example, in the plasma, come from particular organs uh, in, in mm -hmm. tissues, right? And so by studying those metabolites, quantifying them, we could uh, get some information about the aging of particular organs. Mm -hmm. And while organs during aging, they kind of talk to each other, they influence each other. But at the same time, there are uh, situations when a particular organ or system ages at a faster rate. And mm -hmm. this often results in particular diseases associated with aging of particular organs. In, in this case, metabolomics could, could be very useful. I, again, I haven't seen anybody studying this particular aspect of, kind of organ-specific metabolites released by... by it's difficult. Uh, it's really difficult in the blood because, as you said previously, a lot of the metabolites are shared between the different organs. So there are cases, but it's not so easy to find this in the blood, yeah. Yeah, it's but, not easy, but, but I, I yeah. think still it's possible and with better mm -hmm. uh, you know, One example, there was a paper published uh, in Nature in December by Tony Viscare from Stanford, mm -hmm. and uh, they reported this at the level of proteins. And so they quantified several thousand proteins, and they were able to identify proteins in the plasma, yeah. right, which mm -hmm. were secreted by particular organs, and mm -hmm. this provided information about the aging of mm -hmm. particular organs. We yeah, this was a great paper. I remember it too. Yeah, mm -hmm. to follow up on that study as well uh, with, a, with a better data set, and it's working mm. really well. So, I, I mean, in the case of metabolites, it should, in principle, be the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I look forward to reading that paper. Maybe you'll be you'll be putting that one out there. Uh, same yeah, with metabolomics. I, mean, <laughs> I, mean, I guess it's just the beginning of this work. So. Yes. Yes. No, I was joking. Is there any other aspect you, you wanted to discuss of the field of aging before we get to the final question? I would stress that aging okay. really require better use of various omics and integration of various omics. Uh, I think metabolomics here is a very uh, critical component that, that would be used in a kind of multi-omic manner, I think, in the future, but so far mm -hmm. has not been really used that much. There are large cohorts st studies, like UK by Bank, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a very useful data set, and we are generating also using the same platform for our Biobank, mm -hmm. I mean, cooperation with other investigators at Brigham Women's Hospital. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, uh, I think other platforms, of course, are, are also useful, and, and, and a good idea would be to better quantify metabolites, just... Uh, Mm -hmm. to, to the level of tens of thousands. This would be extremely useful, I think, in the future for aging this research. Is the challenge yeah, for any platform, we're not there yet, for sure not. So you usually get, like, even if you get a high number of metabolites, then you lose the absolute quantification aspect. Mm -hmm. If you want to stay absolutely quantitative, you have a little bit less. I think when, when you have a large enough number of subjects that you study, and you control the environment enough, you can still get a lot out of the da those data sets. But when you come from a world of thousands or hundreds of thousands of features, it's uh, something that's maybe difficult to implement in the workflows that you've been working with or that, that doesn't seem as, as attractive, maybe. That I can understand this. 
but it, it brings something else. I think also metabolomics maybe suffers sometimes that from the fact that the, the connection points to other omics are not as easy to find. So you don't have the direct link to a gene, for example, that you would have with proteomics or with transcriptomics or with epigenomics. I see this as a kind of barrier also for the adoption of metabolomics for people who are more used to gene-based omics. This is also one of the, the reasons for this podcast is a bit to, to show examples to people of how metabolomics has been used. And then they can go look into your paper or the papers of other guests to see the methods you've used and, and the approach that you took to see how to do that themselves also. I agree. Yeah. So my last question would be, what's your favorite metabolite? <laughs> I would say I don't have a favorite metabolite. Uh, it, it's like, for example, if you ask me a question like, what's my favorite book or favorite composer? Uh, it mm -hmm. just varies. You know, maybe today I like that music and tomorrow another music. And it's, I always struggle with questions. What is my favorite something? So you I think actually it's a very interesting answer. It's true. And, but and still, it, 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 the same yeah. applies to metabolites. Although I would say, <laughs> maybe I would reverse my, my answer is that I, my favorite historically is still selenium. So if selenium mm -hmm. quantifies as, as a metabolite, you know, or series of metabolites. <laughs> that's, but, that's debatable, but I'll take it. So no, what, I, will, I mean, you what can say selenium cysteine, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it and specifically what you've discovered about um that was particularly interesting because people may not know it? Well, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, selenocysteine mm -hmm. is the 21st amino acid. It's in the encoder. Sure. Uh, it's inserted code translationally. So actually, if selenocysteine is, is used as a dietary source, it's taken up and then degraded elemental selenium and selenocysteine is synthesized on the tRNA mm, uh, and then inserted uh, into proteins. We have several hundred papers actually on that topic uh, uh, and, um, and and also the on the pathway. This was together with Dolph Hatfield in, at NIH. We discovered a pathway for selenocysteine biosynthesis in, in mammals where uh, Selenium is first uh, phosphorylated in selenophosphate by selenophosphate synthetase, and then it is used as selenium donor uh, for selenocysteine biosynthesis, where serine is initially amino isolated to the tRNA, then phosphorylated by a particular kinase that we found called phosphoserial tRNA kinase, uh, those phosphoserine species, and then that one is converted to selenocysteine on the tRNA. It's a very interesting pathway. Mm -hmm. And then inserted into proteins with a specific elongation factor for selenocysteine, where the UGA codon, which is normally as a stop signal, is recoded to function as the codon for selenocysteine. So it's it's very interesting, um, yeah, uh, process. <laughs> it is. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for, for picking a favorite, even though it's not your first intuition. <laughs> So I think we've reached the end of the of the episode. I want to thank you very much for joining me today and for discussing your research on aging and your use of metabolomics. It's been really a very interesting discussion. I learned a lot. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And it's been a pleasure to to discuss these interesting topics with you. Thank you for great questions. Thank you for listening to the Metabolomist. I hope that this episode got you excited about the upcoming applications of metabolomics and that it motivated you to support science that brings a positive impact to our lives. To make sure you never miss an episode, register to our newsletter on the podcast webpage, themetabolomics.com. To learn more about metabolomics and how to plan your own projects, check out my book on metabolomic data interpretation at biocrities.com slash the story principle. And don't forget to connect with me, Alice Lemoussiel, on LinkedIn to continue the conversation on the many ways that metabolomics impacts health, research, and our lives. Mm -hmm.